The following program is sponsored in part by the Hockenden Chamber of Commerce. Hello, I'm Tim Kilduff, and this is Business Matters. It's a program sponsored in conjunction with HCAM by the Hopkins and Chamber of Commerce. Our purpose is uh, really twofold here, and that is to focus on Hopkinton businesses, businesses being operated on, in, in Hopkinton, in and around Hopkinton. But more importantly, when we want to look at the sort of the personality of the people that run those businesses. What makes them unique? What brought them to the stage that they're at? Uh, and I think we've got a, a very interesting story to tell, or to hear, uh, from David Haumacher, who's the managing partner of Guaranteed Better Sales. Hi, David. Hi, Tim. How are you? Good, good. You know, I want to start at the beginning, but let's not go back to Rock Island, Illinois. We don't have to go back that far, where you were born. But I want to, I want to get a sense of um, sort of educational background. Were there uh, particular points where, uh, where you had to make decisions on what you were going to study, for example, and then we can, we can go from there. Growing up in uh, Sidgwick High School, uh, I became involved in the student newspaper and, uh, for journalism, and I noticed, I recognized that there was a, um, there was a connection there. So I pursued a, uh, uh, a degree in journalism, if you will, um, starting off with liberal arts. I'm the fourth of nine children, so finances back in, back in those days were a little tight to come by. So I actually ended up working myself through college, and I started at Cape Cod Community College once I graduated from Situate High. Where then? Now, it, 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 we could spend a whole half an hour on so educational tracks, starting at community college. I'm, I happen to be a big fan of that. I think. I think it's a great place to start, but you must have gone on beyond that. Right. When I graduated from uh, Cape Cod, I made a vow to myself that I wanted to go to a smaller school and, and uh, make an impact on that. So I ended up at Ricker College in Holton, Maine, and um, pursuing my journalistic um, passion, I ended up as the radio station manager in my junior year and the TV station manager in my senior year. How did that, uh, that understanding of the media? That's had to have uh, a big impact on some of the steps that you've taken. Uh, well, it has. To. Um, after my first year at uh, Ricker, I thought I wanted to make the, you know go to the the big stage, if you will, in television production. So I applied to Emerson College in the, in the Back Bay in Boston, and I actually got accepted on probation, depending on what I would get in my second semester in junior year. And I uh, pulled the 4.0. I made the president's list, so they let me in. And then after I, I uh, visited the campus, I found out that <coughs> TV engineer, <coughs> excuse me, TV engineering, um, broadcasting on the big stage really wasn't for me. Uh, so I, uh, I stayed up at Ricker. And as I finished my uh, my degree in broadcast journalism, uh, I came to realize that. I mean, it was more than 30 years ago, they said, if it bleeds, it leads with, uh. the, with the headlines. And even in the small town of Holton, Maine, there was always something going on uh, with a fire or, you know, so d domestic issues. or something. There was always something going on, and they always wanted to lead with that. So when I graduated, um, I wanted to make, a, uh, I wanted to make a, uh, a demonstration of humanity, if you will, because I had the opportunity to go into print journalism, and I said, you know what, I'm not going to lock myself into the world of negativity. I'm not going to uh, um, be a purveyor of, of the negative news. I wanted to be a positive, um, a positive demonstration, if you will. So I uh, plotted a plan to hitchhike. I actually hitchhiked, literally holding out my hand, asking for help from my fellow man. And I left Boston in August, and I went to uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. Hitchhiking? Hitchhiking. How far is that? Uh, well, it's about seven time zones. And then I went to Guatemala City, Guatemala. And then I went over to Key West, Florida. And then I went up to the woods of Quebec. So literally, you could frame the entire four corners of the North American continent 
to, uh, and I did it to prove that I could uh, do it and come back in one piece. Now let me ask you: you Were you financed? Did you have Did you have money in your pocket to go do this? I left with uh, four hundred and seventy-five dollars in my pocket. I had trained after college. Uh, I had trained as a professional chef. So when I got to uh, when I got to uh, Anchorage, Alaska, on Labor Day weekend, I literally went banging on doors with my resume. And um, <clears throat> as luck would have it, uh, I walked into this uh, restaurant on, uh, downtown, and the chef comes out of the kitchen and says, and hires me on the spot, and flies me into Valdez, which was you know a couple of hours away, and, and that happens to be where the uh, oil pipeline right, ends. Right. So they needed a sous chef. So he hired me on the spot, gave me three hours to pack my bags out of the rooming house that I was staying in, and. Um, and then I went out to uh, Valdez and was the uh, the chef of the restaurant. So you start in the Boston area, you put your thumb out. How long did it take you to get from uh, Massachusetts to Alaska? A lot faster than I thought it would be. Um, and I assume you, you paid for no tickets here? Paid for no tickets. Huh. So, um, I mean, it was it was really quick. I mean, the first day I made Buffalo. And uh, the, sec the third day, I was in um, uh, Columbus, Ohio. My roommate in Boston had a roommate from college, and uh, she let me stay with her for the weekend. But it was awful because the first night I was camping out, my hammock fell down and <laughs> into, a, into a, a shrub of uh, poison ivy, oak, and sumac. So by the time I arrived at Linda's place, my hands, my fingers were all blown up to the point where I couldn't go hitchhiking, so I had to um, stay with her for three or four days until that subsided. And from there, I made it to Indianapolis, Indiana, and stayed with my great aunt for the following weekend. And then I really uh, hit the road and made Colorado in just two days. And then it was Wyoming, and then it was Montana, and then it was Vancouver. That first part of that trip, what'd you learn? What'd you learn from that? I mean, to, to say that you made Buffalo in one day is, uh, is quite an accomplishment, I'm assuming, but I, it, it, there had to be more to that than, uh, than meets the eye. Uh, well, this is, um, it was actually that first couple of weeks was uh, literally a life-changing event. I mean, forget about the personal adventure story of it. Uh, what I really connected with was everybody. I mean, over the course of uh, the year that I was traveling, uh, I met hundreds and hundreds of people, and they all said the same thing. They all said, Wow, you're doing what? You left your job? You hit the road? I've always wanted to do that. Yeah, yeah. And I've always wanted to do that, and I don't know why. You know, depending on who, you know, the college people that, that uh, picked me up, the, uh, the middle ages, the old people, oh, I always wanted to do that. But I hearken back because at the other, uh, I had a double degree, broadcast journalism and English literature. And... Um, Jonathan Swift, we studied Jonathan Swift, you know, Gulliver's Travels, sure. and uh, I became, uh, I was intrigued by the whole armchair traveler uh, dynamic, and it really did change my life. The, uh, Jonathan Swift um, wrote for the armchair traveler. The armchair traveler is the person that uh, will read and watch TV and listen to the, the, um, the events behind them, but stay protected in the, in the confines of the chair. So they'll read the stories, they'll read the stories of Gulliver Travel and, and all of the other, and they'll live um, through those stories. So, and I made a, a uh, determination that I wanted to be experiencing and telling the story. Instead did, of you, did this get created out of your own, your own brain, or was there some inspiration that, that gave you the idea, somebody, something, that gave you the idea to... to to start out on this adventure and hitchhike. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people use a lot of excuses to do and not do things. And it would seem to me that one of the, one of the things that I hear is, well, my, the, the, my family uh, will think that I'm crazy. Uh, so one, did they, were there people that thought you were crazy? And two, what was the inspiration for this? How did, how did the, the genesis of the idea of, of hitchhiking come to being? Uh, that's a good question, Tim. Um, those two influences, you know, having the journalistic degree and if it bleeds, it leads, and uh, doing the armchair traveler were really the propelling uh, drivers. Uh, it was a long, hard conversation. I spent the last night before I hit the road with my parents in Situate, and um, 
my mother asked me, you know, for three hours straight, why do you have to do this? Are you sure you're going to be all right? And uh, so I kept in touch, and I would call them for the first couple of weeks, and then I'd write them a note. But for, uh, for my part of inspiration, um, the, other, uh, the other driver, if you will, is that uh, I was born with a heart condition, and I knew someday I would have to have open heart surgery. They didn't know when, but I learned when I was a freshman in high school that I would have to have open heart surgery to replace the valve. So I knew someday, somewhere, somehow, is what the cardiologist says, you'll have to have that valve replaced. And uh, then he said, words that stick with me today, he says, and if we had to do the operation today, you have a 50-50 chance of coming off the table. 50-50 chance. So it took me years and years to realize, but that really was a death sentence, if you will. So that was the third driver. I made a commitment to retire, to live my life before I settled down into a career in a, in a wife and family. So you make it to Buffalo in one day. You go to Indiana. You end up in, in uh, Anchorage, Alaska. Somebody picks you up and, and puts you to work. How long did you stay in Alaska? That was a really tough decision. Uh, Valdez is really an outpost, and there's not much there. And um, they really liked the work that I was doing, so they were assuming that I was going to stay through the winter. And um, that was one of the toughest, hardest things I did. I walked out um, on Columbus Day weekend on my day off, hitchhiked back to Anchorage, and uh, went to Fairbanks, and then I flew to uh, Seattle because I ran into winter. I could not hitchhike back down right, the Alpine. Right. Right. And if I didn't go, that I waited and waited and waited. It was, I struggled with the decision, and then I just did it. And that was, uh, that was tough. It took them three weeks for them to, set, to uh, send me my last paycheck in Seattle. And at that point, I'd gotten another job cooking uh, in uh, the university district. Okay, so you stayed, then you stayed in Seattle how long? Uh, well, it took me three weeks to wait for the paycheck, so I was there for about a month and a half. Okay, and then where? Now, what's the, what's the next leg of the journey look like? Uh, right down the west coast of California, where I, uh, I stayed with some friends that I graduated high school with in uh, Santa Cruz, and then I went down to San Diego because I had to see the San Diego Zoo, right? Right, right. So I stayed, right, right. With, uh, I stayed with a friend that my sister had just met, and we had kept in contact with the letters. And um, that's a memorable corner, if you will, because um, I was at uh, Shelley's house the day uh, John um, Lennon was killed. So that, you know, you know how sometimes sure. things just stick with you? Right. From then I went out to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, where my uh, aunt and uncle were living. And uh, I got a job as the banquet chef at the Phoenix Country Club. And I was there for the Phoenix Open in 1981. And then where? Keep going. Keep going. And then um, well, I was there for, well, for the whole season, right? I was there um, just before Christmas and stayed until the end of uh, January. And then I did what I thought everybody wants to do. Uh, you know, I, I jumped aboard a freight train. Come on. I jumped aboard a freight train. Come on, you didn't, you didn't, no, come on, you didn't buy a ticket on the I didn't Amtrak. buy a ticket. I, uh, it was funny because a couple of, because I was plotting and planning, right? So a couple of days before I jumped on the freight train, I went to the, to the train yard, and I, <laughs> and I went up to the person in charge, and I said, you know, how would I, if I was going to jump on a, a train, uh, how would I do it? And he said, you know, get the heck out of here. I don't ever want to see you again. It's a federal law to do that. Right. <laughs> and... Um, but still, that Saturday night, I came back and, and snuck, on, uh, snuck on board. Now, out there, the freight trains are literally a mile and a half long. One train, a mile and a half long. So I had to walk and walk and walk to, uh, to get to an open door. And uh, I got into the open door. And again, it's the desert. It's Phoenix. It's the end of January. And it's 75 degrees during the daytime. But it gets below freezing at night. I wasn't quite ready for that. So I'm in this boxcar, and we're waiting, and it's shifting, and finally we get underway an hour and a half well, after. We. You said we. We. The train starts to move, and then I hear this noise in the corner, and after we started to move, again, it took me a long time to find the open car and a mile and a half long freight train, but uh, there were literally two hobos in the corner of the freight train. Two hobos, and I, I couldn't believe myself. So I get out my flashlight, and we get to talking to each other. 
and uh, they're literally hobos, and they all they have on is a um, is a, a light jacket, and they're starting to freeze. Well, I had because I'd been to Alaska, I had uh, three season clothing, so I put my coat on and gave them my sleeping bag. So they took the sleeping bag and used it as a blanket, and we were uh, all night going from Phoenix to Tucson, and from there I jumped on in what they call a hot shoe. So the freight train goes north and south, and in Tucson, it goes east and west. So I jumped off in the middle of the day um, and, and got on the one that was going to take me uh, east to El, El Paso. And again, the freight train's a mile and a half long, and I'm looking for an open door, and I find one. And as we start to uh, pull out of the station, this young Mexican kid out of nowhere starts running along the train and hops into the same car uh, that I'm in. And uh, we start talking in Spanish, come to find out he was just leaving Phoenix because he had been there for the winter cooking in restaurants and he was going back home to uh, Mexico. You know, the, the, the personalities that you have run into uh, during this adventure, that's, that's got to have factored. Are there, are there particular personalities that, you, that are still clear in your mind, people that, you know, was there one hobo that stood out above above the others, or were there major personalities that you ran into that that you you took something from? Took something from in terms of your own experience. Getting back to your earlier question about inspirations yep. for taking this trip, uh, Will Rogers. I read a lot of the biography of Will Rogers, and I was intrigued by his ability to be on stage at uh, you know in Symphony Hall and doing his stick and then at night after the show he would be on the the back stop uh, the back step you know having a cigarette with the dishwashers to me that was uh, that has made a uh, a point with me so um, it's really the whole gamut right when I was in Seattle I I fought my way in to see the uh, election speech of, of Walter Mondale in 1980 I actually got on to the um, the Boeing plant where he gave a speech, and then I'm on a freight train with these hobos. So to answer your question, there are several uh, different personalities that have stayed with me, um, but mostly it's the unique it's the unique conversations with the unique people. Mm. I remember going um, heading towards uh, on the Alaska Highway. There was this guy in this huge 1973 Cordoba, you know, a Cordoba, you know, floating floating living room. And he was an executive for the oil companies out there. And out there, the oil derricks are hundreds of miles apart. And he was like a regional manager. And he says, uh, you know what my retirement plan is with my wife? You know what we're going to do? He says, I don't know when it's coming, but we know it's coming. So we're going to, to build a house in the outback, and we're going to become self-sufficient. We're going to have all the heating. We're going to have solar design. We're going to be able to provide for our own food because the Armageddon is coming. The Armageddon is coming. There's going to be a point in the not-too-distant future wow. where everybody's going to be running for scarce resources, and we're going to prepare ourselves for it. There was a period in, in, in my lifetime when people did a lot of that. started with, right. uh, with shelters and in your basement and that sort of thing. So we, we're, we're on the train. Uh, you're, you're heading... North, south, east, west, and then you take a you take another change in direction. You go to a different country, essentially. How did that transpire? Well, I had uh, done pretty well in in college at Cape Cod Community with uh, Spanish. I had taken uh, two uh, two courses in it, the beginning and the advanced, and I was uh, pretty fluent with it. Having had the couple of years after graduation in the restaurant uh, business in Boston, I was really, you know, English was um, uh, rare. I would, I, would not, I would speak Spanish more than I would speak English when I was working. So that was, uh, that was, more, that was easy for me. Uh, but I'll never forget the, my, my uh, boss, the, uh, the uh, chef at the, at the country club, and the... Um, the general manager, they thought I was crazy for wanting to go to Guatemala. Um, but it was something that I, I wanted to do. I always wanted, I really wanted to go to Costa Rica, but that was too far down. Um, so as I'm pulling into El Paso, the, the, uh, the teenager that I was with, he climbs down off of the freight train and just effortlessly swings himself backwards when the train is going 15 miles an hour and walks away from the train. 
I said, boy, that looked easy. So I did the same thing. I, I got my blue bag, the, the, the big backpack, and uh, I tried to do the same thing, and I fell flat on my face. I fell flat on my face in a gravel uh, rock bed and ended up with holes in both knees and both elbows and on my face. So that was a rude awakening to, uh, to El Paso. Huh. But then I went down, um, and again, it, it's, it's a couple of hundred miles to go from... Um, to go from El Paso into the, uh, the first town. When I got there, um, I was a little bit nervous. The first thing I did was catch a bus because it was the high desert and there weren't really you know, highways going through. And um, once I got going, I mean, the first destination outside of Mexico City was Acapulco. Don't you always want to go to Acapulco? Sure, I mean, everybody yeah. wants to go to Acapulco. So uh, that was, um, it took me three days to get there, but then I got there and then I just, I just kept going right down the coast until I ran out of roadway. And then um, the road turned into a, uh, into a dirt road. Uh, so I got past that and then I went into Guatemala and I knew I was going too far when I got to Guatemala City because the guy that had picked me up from the Mexican border took me all the way into Guatemala City. He said, I didn't want to scare you, but you know, look at that. And he showed me a, uh, a bullet hole in his car. He was the, uh, the, the uh, South America regional person for Revlon, or some, some huge multinational company. He was stationed in Guatemala City, and he says, you really don't want to go any farther because the civil war in Guatemala is uh, to a point where it's not safe at night. So I spent a couple of days there, and then I turned around and went, uh, and went back to, to Mexico. At that point, I mean, there's only so much I can do in my demonstration for humanity, right? Right, right. So um, I gathered my senses, turned around, and, and went back. You know, we, we haven't uh, gotten to guaranteed better sales, and um, I want to want to see if you'd be willing to uh, sit through another program so we can focus on that, because I think... Uh, I don't think, I know there are some formulas uh, to success that I think are important to get out. So uh, I want to wrap this up, this part of it up, but would you be willing to uh, sit for another session so we, we can get uh, and drill down a little bit on, uh, on what you're doing now? Absolutely. All right, good. Uh, so you, have, have you cataloged this? Have you, did you keep a journal? Uh, do you have notes? Uh, how, have you captured some of these experiences? I have, actually. Um, again, going back to my um, English literature degree, um, a year after I returned from uh, being on the road for a year, going to Alaska and, and Key West and all that, um, I decided I was going to be Ernest Hemingway. Uh -huh. and Ernest Hemingway lived on the island of Cuba and wrote from there. Well, I couldn't get to Cuba, so instead I moved myself on my bicycle to the island of Cozumel which is as close as you can get to Cuba. And uh, from there, I started writing, uh, you know, collecting. I had uh, 21 journals from my trip, and I started to condense that into uh, the first draft of my book. Okay, so you did journal while you, were, while you were on the road. Right, and the draft of Four Corners for Humanity is three-quarters of the way done. Now, I'm assuming tracking will, will, will transition. Tracking and journaling, keeping accurate records will transition and, and uh, be used in, uh, in the philosophy that, uh, for which you run guaranteed better sales, I would think. Exactly. And when you couple that with the power of technology, uh, I've, I've uh, put together a combination of powerful best practices that companies have used to actually grow sales year after year after year. To grow sales from last year to this year is okay. A lot of, a lot of companies do that. But less than 10% of the companies in any businesses can actually say they grow sales year after year after year on a consistent basis without having the, uh, the luxury of mergers and acquisitions. Mm. Mm. Is, it a, is it a goal in life to take these journals and, and, and actually finish a book? It is. It is, actually. I've been thinking recently of maybe combining the two, the four corners for humanity, with the best practices of guaranteed better sales, but... Um, I'm not sure where that's going to go at this point. Now you have uh, you have a family. I do. A uh, couple daughters. One daughter, Emily. She just started yeah. uh, in high school at Hoppington High, 
and uh, my wife of uh, 17 years. Have you shared this story with her? Um, Probably more than no, she wants to hear, I would no, think. Actually, no? Uh, no, actually, I haven't uh, shared this story with her. Well, I think it's phenomenal because I, uh, I think deep down inside of most of us, we wish we could do something like you did, whether it's ride a bike across the country or, or, uh, or hitchhike or take three months off and do individual studies. I think, uh, I think it'd be an interesting story. You ought to, you'd, I'd encourage you to do that. It might be interesting. How old is she? How old is your daughter? Uh, she's 14. She just started go. high school. So you would be in favor after she, if, if she decides to go to college, this kind of an adventure, you would, I would assume you would support. Well, realistically, people stopped uh, safely hitchhiking, you know, several right. years ago. But yes, uh, to go on an adventure to Europe or to Australia or to do something uh, in a concentration where it's a world experience for yep. her, absolutely. Well, interesting first part uh, of this program. I appreciate you focusing on, uh, on really the personal side of it. It's going to be interesting in our continuing discussion to see how this relates to now guaranteed better sales and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis now. But for now, I'd like to thank you for listening. This is Business Matters. We'll see you next time. people, the gang members in the neighborhood. My brother, he wouldn't be happy at all if I was to tell him I was going to drop out of school. He would not approve of that because then that's going to be two of us not handling our business. Me and my friends are close and we all believe in each other. I know they could graduate even if it takes them longer than the four years. We have classes together, so we study together. We help each other at home. I realized we messed up in the past. I failed a couple classes before, not doing as much work as I should be doing. My two best friends, they keep me working hard. Anyone else? My name is David, and in eight years, I'll be an alcoholic. I do. I'll start drinking in middle school, just at parties. But my parents won't start talking to me about it till high school. And by then, I'll already be in some trouble. Kids who drink before age 15 are five times more likely to have alcohol problems when they're adults. The thing is, my parents won't even see it coming. So start talking Who's next? before they start drinking.